The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development, with a platform and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives. At The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. Sandy Newbegin. Sandy is a meditation teacher, coach, speaker, best-selling author, and creator of Calmology, as seen on television in 30-plus countries. With a unique ability to get to the heart of your issues with simplicity, humor, and in ways that make sense. Sandy is one of the most popular experts in his field today. Sandy is the number one best-selling author of six books and two albums, including Mind Calm, Body Calm, Funk, Heal the Hidden Cause, and New Beginnings. His most recent book is called Calm Cure, published by Hay House. My work with him, well, I've, I met Sandy again through mutual friends and, um, he's come, he comes across as what he is. He's just a very nice guy, very calm, obviously, and very eloquent. And he just knows exactly what he's doing. So if, and when it came down to meditation, this is something that you're looking into. I would highly recommend you look into Sandy because I think he's just, I just think he's just great at what he does. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy the interview and it's going to relax you. Thank you so much. Hi, welcome. I'm Bernardo Moya and welcome to Inspiring People. Uh, today I've got the pleasure of interviewing Sandy Newbigging, who is the author and, uh, of many books, 10 books and five Amazon number ones. Uh, and in particular, he's a meditation teacher. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so tell me a little bit about yourself and kind of your, your, where, we, where you were born and your early years. Well, when I was, I was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and uh, come from a very normal family, I guess, you know, brother, parents. Uh, but I did find school pretty tricky. Um, I was bullied a lot during school, and I think... I found refuge in self-help books, you know. Oh, yeah. I was petrified of public speaking. I was petrified of, you know, reading out loud in English class. And, and I literally faked illness for over a whole term because I was so scared of being the centre of attention and stuff. And the first book I actually ever read, because I was so scared of it, words and English, the first book I ever read was a self-help book uh, called uh, Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. Yes. And it really spoke to me, and it really, you know, it was very young at the time, but it was like this, this amazing story that showed me there was more to life than the fear and the bullying and the limitations, you know, it really spoke to me. Was there, sorry, was there a reason in particular that you felt that you, you had this kind of like a lack of confidence or? Well, it's just, uh, I, like I said, I was just bullied. I always felt like the odd one out. I always felt yeah. like different. Um, you know, one of my long-term memories from school is, you know, a lot of people were probably playing sport and stuff, but my memory was kind of standing against this wall and everyone else is playing. And I'm kind of, you know, I always felt a bit isolated that way, mm. you know. And I don't know how it happened. It was just the path I was meant to take and it motivated me to start looking more inward and uh, relatively early in my life. And um, and so I, I had this, I found out in my early years, if I was helping people, they weren't bullying me. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, my motives have changed since then. Yeah. But initially, you know, that was my motives was like a, I found that if I was being useful or giving some advice or something, that I was actually, you know, befriending them and of value. And then, so I thought, well, I'll get into management consultancy. And I went to university, did my honours degree in international management and, and managed about a year doing the nine till or the eight till six job. And it really wasn't for me. So branched out. Was there any subjects in particular that, you, that stood out to you uh, when you were studying? Uh, you know, I just loved the. I, I took the international route because I always felt like I wanted to make sure that I connected with as many different cultures and people as possible. And uh, you know, even in the UK, it's still international, even within the UK these days. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to have that ability to to connect, to understand different cultures, different belief systems, ideologies, and I always had a fascination with that. You know, so mm. um, and you know, I had this really key turning point uh, when I went to my my boss after the the, the initial year and. And it was day to get the contract, you know, and um, they turned to me and said, we aren't going to be able to give you what you want, but you have till four o'clock. And if you don't sign it, then don't come back tomorrow. And it was really this, oh. this turning moment, you know, this turning point, this choice point where, like, do I sign this contract for a job I don't even love, don't really want to do? And even the, the, the three month clause in the contract feels like an eternity. Or do I step out into the unknown? And 
and I stepped out and I've been self-employed with my own businesses ever since. So it's right. about 13 years ago now. Well, it's funny because it's one of the questions I normally tend to ask because there's a common denominator with so many people that there is a turning point, something in particular that triggers either you know a new journey or, or something. Well, that was a turning point when it came to the career. But when it came to meditation, because I, I, I left that, that job, I, I trained in things like coaching, NLP, timeline therapy, EFT, and all these other <laughs> initials. And uh, before, before I knew it, um, I found myself being invited to uh, Spain uh, to help out at a detox retreat. Now, at that point, I only thought detox was for drug addicts. I didn't know people paid to get pipes up their bum and <laughs> you know, juice fast and starve themselves for a week. But lo and behold, I found myself in Spain, and, and the first person I wanted to work on uh, I think it was IBS, and I had to be honest and say, "What's that?" I, I'd never worked in the physical industry before, you know, the, that realm. Uh, I'd worked with emotions and you know, confidence and things like that. And uh, long story short, through that retreat, I accidentally created the what became known as the Mind Detox Method because I was the Mind guy on a detox retreat. And then a few months later, I found myself in Turkey in a room with a, a director, a couple cameramen, uh, sound guys, and. And they were like, okay, do your mind detox thing. And, and it was part of a, a couple of television series that ended up being syndicated and sold to 30 countries. And before I knew it, I was all over the place. Uh, but that was really tricky for me because although I was out there doing all this therapy and helping people be happier, I wasn't actually feeling that happy. And, and it was a really scary moment to feel like a bit of a fraud because I was all, you know, in newspapers and 30 countries on TV and magazines. I'm like, oh, this doesn't feel right. What, what was missing in what was missing was myself. Hmm. <laughs> what was missing was uh, the present moment. What was missing was was the inner stability that I've discovered through meditation. But I didn't know that I needed that. But that led to um, a rocky time in my relationship at the time. And although I was with a girl in my dreams, driving the car in my dreams, in the house in my dreams, more money I thought I'd ever get, um, Range Rover, all that sort of stuff, um, overnight I kind of lost it. And then... I realized, you know what, I'm not actually any happier or any sadder. I'm, I'm kind of just the same as I was before, with, with or without it. And it was around about that time someone said, have you tried meditation? My first answer was, oh, I can't meditate, you know. And they said, how do you know you can't meditate? And how old were you then, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, uh, 27, 28. Okay. okay. Yeah. It was a real, that was the real turning point. It was when I was 27, 28, um, I met my first meditation teacher. I went on my first meditation course. Um uh, they said, you know, can you, you know, I said I couldn't meditate. They said, how do you know? I was like, well, I can't stop my mind. And they said, well, you don't have to stop your mind to experience peace when meditating. And to me, that didn't make any sense whatsoever, that I didn't have to stop my mind to experience peace. Because every book I'd read, every guru I'd watched on YouTube or whatever, had all been talking about, you know, peace of mind. And I assumed that I had to get rid of my thoughts and emotions. So I was confused, but I was curious. And I went along to, to, to do that meditation course. And... Um, I had the most amazing couple of days and I felt I'd found exactly what I was looking for. And uh, and long story short, I ended up heading off and meditating with the monks that trained me um, for, for six months and really dove into meditation. And you were kind of like completely immersed in it, weren't you, like 24-7? Yeah, it, yeah literally uh, for, si for six months, I spent 10 weeks on the island of Patmos and then went straight over to Mexico for a further 14 weeks and have been on you know, meditation. Uh, month-long meditation routes ever since and but during the initial what's called the mastery course um yeah you're literally you know you work up to it but you end up doing about 18 hours of meditation a day 18 uh, hours yeah wow. so i mean but you work up to that yeah. and um at that point you're just so in the stillness in in the retreat you know in the experience exploring the inner self that uh it that you're so present that it doesn't feel like 18 hours you know when you're present and engaged and enjoying what you're doing, time disappears. You know, have you noticed that? Yeah, absolutely. So when it doesn't feel like 18 hours when, when you're in that sort of mm. experience, and it's not like about the time. It, it was more just a, uh, you know, it just happened to be the case Being sometimes. Being completely immersed in it. Yeah. I mean, these days, uh, I'm encouraging people to maybe do 20 minutes a couple of times a day. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's not like you have to do that. That's for what I wanted to do with my life. Um, it was important to have this really solid grounding you know, mm. in the inner stillness. And and why do you think it is so important to people to meditate? Essentially, life is happening right now. You know, we've we've heard that the pre you've got to live in the present moment and stuff. And and in, in its simplest way, there's no such thing as a present moment thought. 
There's no such thing as a present moment thought. And so if we're thinking all the time, we're going to be missing the present moment. We're going to be missing reality. And we're going to be lost in our thoughts, lost listening to the voice in our head, lost in our imagination and our, and our past memories and our future, all, all that stuff. We're kind of distracted. You know, the mind thinks about life but does not directly experience it. It's our awareness that exists within us that's experiencing, whereas it's the, the mind is, is a thinking about tool. And most people are going about their lives thinking about life. And because they're in their mind thinking about life, they're one step removed from life. And, and so for that simple reason, I believe meditation is as important as sleeping, eating and drinking enough water. Because without eating, sleeping and drinking, you don't have life. Without meditation, you're not present enough to experience life. So you don't actually have a life either. And a lot of people are rushing around thinking all the time and they're completely missing themselves, completely missing the moment. And they're essentially living in an illusion as opposed to in reality. Mm. That's a great answer. Thank you. Uh, tell me uh, about your, your first book. My very first book came about because was, it, was, it was 10 books ago. And uh, I wasn't planning to write a book. Um, I was preparing for a workshop. I, I'd been doing work, workshops for a couple of years and I wanted to mix it up a little bit. So I decided to run a workshop that started at 3 p.m. in the afternoon and ended at dawn the next day. And when, we, when they arrived, we went straight out for a picnic to experience the now. And then we had guest speakers and then we had an evening uh, midnight fire walk and Celtic storytelling around the fire and then a dawn meditation. I wanted to like mix it up a little bit. And as I was preparing for that workshop, I was just writing and I realised while I was looking at the page that I'd actually potentially accidentally written my first book. So I called my friend up and I'm like, I think I've written a, a book. And he's like, <laughs> really? I'm like, yeah, no, I never planned to. And he's like, what are you going to call it? I said, I have no idea. And he said, would you have the angel cards I gave you for Christmas? And, you know, everyone's got a pack, you know, the do read virtue <laughs> angel cards. Millions have been sold. And so I was like, yeah, so I grabbed them and I'm on the phone, you know, trying to go through these angel cards while I'm on the phone to him. And he says, right, stop. And so I open up the deck and it's the angel card, New Beginnings. Mm-hmm. And I look at it honestly and go, oh, New Beginnings. And he's like, yeah, Sandy <laughs> New Beginning. <laughs> Maybe a good name for your first book, you know? Hello. I'm like, <laughs> and it was one of these beautiful moments where, you know, the obvious answer can be staring in front of your face, wow. but you can miss it. Yeah. Powerful. You know, and, and that's often the case with life. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, so I ended up uh, publishing that first book and uh, self publishing it. And I was looking at it thinking, well, it's very nice, but it wouldn't necessarily appeal to people my own age. And so that I was inspired one night after watching an Oasis documentary. And I just literally sat down at two in the morning and, the next morning, uh, when I was still awake, um, I'd, I'd, I'd written a, my second book, which was essentially a quotes book. Okay. And I called it Wisdom Without Waffle. Okay. And it was just literally just, you know, this funky quotes that were yeah. more down to earth, um, nothing too airy fairy. Yeah. And so that was my first book. And then from then, I started getting on the circuit of doing talks and things. And that was when I got invited to, to be on the TV. And then the next book deals obviously came because I was on the telly. Mm. So. <laughs> That helped. And how has it worked for you to be on the telly? I mean, I suppose you've enjoyed it. You've learned a lot from it. What can you share? Uh, I think, you know, with, with TV, it's, it's tricky to get, pub, you know, productions that have the investment for uh, genuine shows, like mm. really genuine shows. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I loved about the shows that I did uh, was that, you know, we were showing people's journey over a, over a couple-week period. Uh, with, in the middle of that period, they were doing a seven-day uh, mind and body and soul detox and it was like literally flying the wall stuff they were, you were seeing everything and people would contact me and they would they were they were very touched by the emotional stories that people were going through they could really relate to when we were exploring the potential mind-based causes and it led to some really good tv because people would be the, the, the client themselves would be, would be it would be a blind spot for them but the viewers would be like it's plain to the other person it's this this is the cause you know and so just people observing that journey of, of someone having this blind spot and then seeing that and having this breakthrough and you know for we had a guy called Paul and he was quite overweight and he had psoriasis all over his body and then with a three month catch up it all gone you know we had Juliet who was uh, had adult acne but she also had uh a uh, major fear of, of dirt. She was a compulsive cleaner. And, you know, with her, it was amazing because we went back and found that the root cause of her compulsive cleaning was when she was racially abused in a subway tunnel, working, walking home from school one time. Oh, okay. And what happened was that, you know, she had this intense fear of death, of, of being attacked. But she also remembered there being it being really dirty in the subway tunnel and the mind had made the association. 
And so when we collapsed that and healed that for her, she started doing pointer lessons with her kids and all the rest of it. And there's, there's some really inspiring little you know stories in these TV shows. And, mm. and and what was lovely about them for me was that I didn't have to do much marketing for about four years because <laughs> <laughs> people had seen it and they would just you know we'd be able to come along and I could focus my efforts on on helping people as opposed to trying to tell them about it all. You know, mm. so TV is great for getting the word out. Mm. If you're interested in working with me contributing to the magazine, maybe speaking at any of our many events around the world, partnering or licensing The Best You, go to www.thebestyou.co. So I know that on your latest book, you talk about the the dependency that we've got on, conven- on conventional medicines yeah, and how, you know, uh, meditation can help. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. And Well, I was quite shocked to, to you know, to read the statistics where uh, you know, 70% of Americans are on at least one prescription drug and 50% of uh, British women are on, on one prescription drug. These are these are big statistics, you know. Uh, 22 million prescriptions for paracetamol uh, in 2014, a 13% rise in the, ne- in the previous year, a cost of £80 million pounds for the taxpayer just on paracetamol alone. You know, these are... The, the, the scary statistic is the fact it's a 13% rise in the previous year because across the population, that's a big number. That's a very big number. And and so our our, our, our dependency on, on, on doctors and drugs are, are rising. At the same time, the, the pressures and stress in the National Health Service are at, you know, a bursting point. We're constantly being told. And, and there needs to be an alternative approach. And people are not just seeing it financially, but they're, they're recognising it within themselves. We're starting to recognise more and more uh, as a collective that we're not just a body and therefore it does not work to always aim to find physical causes for physical conditions. It's a very limited view to say, well, I've got a physical condition, it must have a physical cause. Uh, that's just not the way. You know, you think about a food you like, your mouth waters. You get embarrassed, your face turns red. Um, you get nervous, you get butterflies in your stomach. These are all everyday mind-body connection uh, causes uh, to physical reactions. And the more you start to explore the mind-body connection, and there's been over 10,000 studies in the last 10 years on it, including uh, the health benefits of meditation and stuff, when you start exploring uh, the mind-body connection, you, it's, it starts to become very obvious that my mind is undeniably affecting my body, and vice versa. And if I have a physical condition, it's no longer such a big leap to uh, want to explore what's been going on in my life recently. How, how stressed have I been? What emotional uh, dis-ease have I been experiencing on the lead-up to this dis- disease showing up? And you start to uh, become much more empowered because we're no longer a victim to to this uh, body that just you know, breaks, goes faulty, uh, wear and tear, age, you know, all these these common answers to why people get sick. It's just, it's just a, a cop-out as far as I'm concerned. Mm. And we need to uh, take responsibility ourselves and, and be empowered, not to beat ourselves up because it's my fault, but more see physical conditions as a, as a wake-up call to make some sort of positive change within ourselves and within our life. And welcome change. Well, you know, to be honest, we, we want to make that change, but sometimes fear can be standing in the way. And, and the body is, you know, the body doesn't just get sick at the first sign of, of an issue in your life. We've, we've had the, the intuitive hits, we've had the frequent feelings, we've had the reflections from our friends in the universe. And, mm-hmm. and we've known for a while, actually, something's not quite right um, within ourselves, but we've not necessarily listened to it. And, and the body uh, is, is, can actually be one of our greatest teachers in this lifetime. It can be one of our best friends in this lifetime. And in body cam, I'm encouraging people to befriend their body and stop being in a battle with it. Recognize that body is constantly adapting to survive. And in the book, I go through a number of conditions that kind of, and kind of to try and demonstrate why that's the case. For example, psoriasis is a, an extra thick layer of skin, essentially. And more often than not, people dealing with psoriasis issues have got some sort of external threat, feeling bullied in their life or some sort of under attack. And so the body is creating this extra thick layer of defense to, to cope with it. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah. So when you start to, you know, explore the mind-body connection, how the body's responding, it's actually on our side. It's adapting to survive. You know, the body's literally got our back. Mm. And uh, if we uh, listen to it, Uh, not only can we help ourselves heal, but we can also experience much greater happiness more generally in our life as well. Thank you. Uh, Also, I think kind of looking at the stats, and I've discussed it with some of the guests previously, when we're looking at depression 
and for example, male suicide being the, the biggest killer of men in the UK. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. Yes. Uh, wow. Suicide is, is the biggest killer of men in, in the UK. And, and 76%, I think, of all suicides um, are, are male. Um, so what's your thoughts regarding that and, and how meditation could help? Well, obviously, I've just heard that stat, but it doesn't surprise me because about uh, 70 to 80% of people that shop in my workshops are women. Mm. You know, uh, women are willing to ask for help, share their emotions, uh, work through things, don't just bury them, don't try and just hold it all together. And, you know, they're actually willing to express and share. And there's been loads of studies that have actually proven that that not the health benefits, but the the coping benefits with just sharing, you know. Uh, Not going into your story, but just at least sharing that you've got an issue running. And a lot of men aren't sharing that. And so um, I'm not surprised that it it builds up to that point where they see no other way out than than just shutting off from from the the pain or discomfort or whatever in the first place. When it comes to meditation and how it can help, well, it can help massively. Because one of the biggest things that are causing people uh, emotional unrest and dissatisfaction in life is this voice in their head that sounds like them. This voice in their head that sounds like them is the is telling them how good their life is, how confident they are, how lovable they are, how attractive they are, how successful they are, what sort of future they're going to have, what sort of past they've had. This little voice in their head that sounds like them is 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 the uh, working in the scenes really impacting people's health or distress. And meditation helps you start to see that voice in your head as just like any other thought, and to let it come and go, not take it so personally, not take it so seriously. And and so when you start to change your relationship with your mind, which is a key part of mind calm, key part of body calm techniques, when you start to change your relationship with your mind, you start to see your mind not be your mind. You start to see that the mind is constantly playing what I like to call the judgment game. It's constantly in its desire to make sense of reality, deciding if what's happened, happening or might happen is good or, bo- good or bad, right, wrong, better, worse, positive or negative. Constantly trying to put everything into a box of good or bad, right, wrong, better, worse, positive, negative. And if we end up on the bad, wrong, worse, or negative side of things, we end up with what's called a problem. You know what I mean? And we end up, the mind gets very busy thinking about problem solving it or it drops into the poor me or at least tries to think positive. But we're still in the head. We're still in the mind, missing the moment the entire time. <laughs> and we're not seeing the judgments. We're being the judger. And so one of the main biggest shifts a person can, can make, especially in the context of of you know the depression, anxiety, and, and eventually you know big issues like suicide, is that if you can start to see that voice that is dictating things, and you can start to see the judgments instead of being the judger, you start to create a space between you, which is the permanent, unchanging, underlying, still, silent awareness, and this temporary mind that's got all these millions of opinions that aren't aren't even yours. They're your your parents, your teachers, your media. <laughs> They're other people's opinions most of the time. And so that can shifting your your relationship with your mind makes an epically huge difference when it comes to uh, experiencing greater inner peace and happiness. That's great advice. Thank you very much. Um, what's what's your thoughts uh, regarding learning? I mean, I assume that you are one that reads a lot. And what's your thoughts regarding education and learning? Oh, that's a good question. What's my thoughts on learning? What what my thoughts? Um, you know, if I'm going to take it from the meditation perspective, uh, for me, uh, learning is great, but not if it is being uh, made more important than wisdom. Uh, we are born with access to wisdom. You know, we've all met little kids that have had these amazing, you know, wise words come out of their mouths. And they've not read that from a book. They've not overheard it from their parents. It's just, it's intrinsic into us. And as we're growing up and as we go to certain types of schools and stuff, we can get conditioned to not trust that intuition. We can become too reliant on the conceptual mind and only reliant on what we've learned in the past, as opposed to being open to wisdom, open to inspiration, open to intuition. So when you start to let go of all this thoughts and thinking, and therefore you don't know, you're not just relying on the past, and you come back into the present moment, you're able to access spontaneous creativity, spontaneous intuition, spontaneous knowing, and a much deeper wisdom that's beyond your years and beyond your reading. Um, I actually, hand on heart, have not read millions of books. When I sit down to write my books, there's nothing around me except me and my laptop, because I don't want to regurgitate what's been said before. I want to create a space for something new to, to come through. And so my job as a writer is to sit there engage the stillness, engage the silence, 
and listen. Listen. Not listen to what I already knew before, but listen for something fresh. And so when it comes to learning, I think obviously education is really important, but not if it's going to be made more important than this spontaneous and, and immediate inner knowing and wisdom that we're actually born with built in. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, what, what would you say your best assets are? My best assets? Um, well, <laughs> the feedback I receive is I uh, have, we all have a skill. We're all good at something, you know, and I appear to be quite good at getting uh, these ancient traditions and techniques and ideas and modernizing them and simplifying them and communicating them in ways that um, make sense. Uh, people can uh, uh, apply very quickly. You know what I mean? Mm. When I first started out um, with my first couple of books, you know, I was wanting to prove myself and and be a good writer and be seen as clever. And and so I had these 10 steps for that and 15 <laughs> steps for this and stuff. And it actually became very apparent to me that actually, you know, it needs to get so simple, so simple. Literally, if you can get it to one step, ideal. Mm. Because people might actually do it. We don't have time for 10 steps before breakfast. You know, we're, we're busy. Uh, and it will you forget, uh, what, you know, in the moments of trauma or difficulty. And so I intend to share as many things as I can that are simple and engaged and help people to lead more free existences and more free lives. I don't know if that was a very good answer or not. That's a brilliant answer. That's your <laughs> answer. That's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> My uh, worst answer is questioning whether that was a good answer. <laughs> uh, listen, that was a good answer. <laughs> Uh, it's difficult for some people to say, you know, what their best assets are. But it's important because I think, it, it is, you know, we do recognise But sometimes it helps us as authors or, or speakers to, to really explain I mean, it clearly. Yeah, I mean, the, the feedback I get is that, you know, people love my books because it, they make sense and they're simplified and, and, they, and things they may have heard before are said in a way that actually they can embody. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really, really fundamentally important. So with your latest books, uh, Mind... Uh, calm, yeah, body calm and soul calm. Well, that's not that's not yet yeah. coming. Tell us kind of like the the process of those books and 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 what's your idea behind them? Well, with with uh, I wanted to have uh, meditation techniques that are very effective at helping people to get the huge benefits from meditation, but they're more modern day and accessible and and enjoyable. So, mind calm is uh, the modern day meditation technique that gives you peace with your mind. Uh, in other words, you don't have to stop all your thoughts, get rid of all your emotions, manage, manipulate, control and change your, your circumstances all the time. It teaches you how to rest into the inner presence of stillness, the inner presence of quiet, the inner presence of calm, which exists within all of us. But it's just become a bit buried under all the thoughts and thinking. We've become distracted from ourselves. And so it helps you to rest into these inner states of being uh, that are really our birthright to experience, but we've just become distracted from through uh, an identity crisis to think thinking that we're something that we're not we think we're a job title we think we're our uh, relationship status we think our political uh, affiliations we think we're a religious religion belief, religious beliefs or whatever but reality is these things are all temporary but we are the permanent aspect of ourselves and we really need to get to know that permanent aspect of ourselves in this lifetime if we are really going to know thyself and wake up to true peace the way I, ask, I talk about it in Mind Calm is I, I start the book with a question. How do you know you have a mind? And the simple answer to that question is you know you have a mind because you are aware of it. Yeah? Hmm. Uh, you know you have thoughts, you know you have this voice in your head that sounds like you, you know you have imagination and all the rest of it. So what that means is we have a mind and we have something that's aware of our mind. Now a lot of therapy techniques and personal development self-help stuff is about changing, managing, fixing, improving and manipulating the inner workings of the mind. That's not what mind calm or body camera are about. These meditation techniques are about becoming much more interested in and attentive to the awareness that's aware of the mind. Yeah? Mm. Because what you discover is this awareness is already at peace, it's very still and content, and it's beyond the mind, it's beyond judgment, it's beyond resistance, it's beyond attachment, it's it's living in an more unconditionally. And so when you start to hang out here, you start to experience what your awareness feels like and your awareness is calm and complete and, and unconditionally loving. And so you get to experience these things that we've been trying to get by fixing the mind instantly, not later, but now, because this awareness is also aware of now occurring. So the doorway to the present moment and the doorway to your access yourself is to rest into the awareness that's aware. 
Most people are so aware of what they are aware of, they're missing what's actually aware. So they're not self-aware. Mm. And to be self-aware is not to be aware of all the thoughts and stuff, it's to be aware of the aspect of yourself that is aware. And as you rest into that, you discover a peace that's always present, and it's there irrespective of what's happening in your circumstances, in your body, in your relationships, in your bank balance or whatever. And you stop confusing your life circumstances for your life experience. You know, a lot of people think they've got a bad life because they're, un- they're judging their life circumstances. But when you rest back into the awareness and start to experience this moment, well, you realize all is well and, and, and peace is continuous. So that's what body, uh, sorry, that's what mind calm is all about. And it's a very powerful, uh, simple way to become more consciously aware. The calm part stands for conscious awareness life meditation. Mm. So they're about being consciously aware in life through open and closed eye meditation. To find out more about our latest projects, get a free coaching lesson or download my book, go to www.bernardo-moya.com. And sorry if I can add on to that. I, th- I think it's a great concept and, 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 I, and I don't meditate, but I, I have meditated. Uh, but kind of for me, when I came across oh, my first encounter with NLP, was for the first time I actually was aware that I had an internal voice and yep. and I was aware of what it was saying to me and how it was talking to me. So I became aware of my thoughts, you know, my late thirties or and 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 I get what you're saying and I think um, I think it's a very interesting point, especially as you say, you know, your circumstances aren't you know, who you are or, or where you are and, and exactly. that awareness is important. So yeah. So. Exactly. It's so important. You know, we just spent a weekend uh, doing embodying calm course at Regents College and uh, Regents University, it's called these days, and you know those seventy odd people in the room, you know, all experiencing awareness, and and you know a huge portion of them have written since saying that they're just amazed by the peace they're experiencing, the calm, the physical things that are are clearing up either they already, you know, uh, some people have been in real chronic pain and it's they're like ninety percent better just after a couple of days, you know, is. The, the, the power of awareness when it comes to experiencing, you know, li- if you can experience life through your awareness instead of through your mind, everything changes. Mm. If you can experience life through the awareness instead of all this chatter and judgments and resistance and attachment and blame and external focus, you know, it, it's absolutely fundamental. And one of the reasons that I wanted to write Body Calm is because, you know, Stress is regularly cited as being one of the main causes of physical conditions on the planet. At the same time, meditation is known for millennia as being one of the most effective ways to reduce stress. But there hasn't been uh, a meditation technique that's been purposely designed with an understanding of the mind-body connection to target the main underlying causes of stress uh, and help someone uh, return to, to greater health. And so that's why I wanted to create Body Calm. Over the last 10 years, I've been exploring the mind-body connection. I've been researching it through hundreds of clients. I've trained practitioners in my methods from 15 plus countries. I've read hundreds of case studies, all exploring the mind-based causes of conditions. And through that understanding and background, I've been able to see correlations and themes as to when someone has a physical condition, what sort of are the most common mind-based causes? What sort of things are going on in a person's life to create certain conditions, you know? Mm. And so with the meditation technique, I really wanted to create a technique that had three main purposes. Number one, to help us disengage the fight, flight, freeze response, because it's all well and good telling someone to go and relax. But if they're stuck in this fight, flight, stressed response to life, then they're not actually going to, the body's not going to have permission to relax. So the first thing was to give the body the rest it needs to recover. The second uh, intention and, and benefit of body calm is to clean up the communications happening between the mind and body. Because often when someone's ill, they can become their own self-fulfilling prophecy because they're focusing so much on how uncomfortable they are, how sick they feel, how they might ne- why they might never get better. They're focusing on everyone else and how it took them years to get better or whatever. You know what I mean? The the the, the their negativity and the thoughts the body's constantly responding to. So we need to clean up the communications happening between the mind and body in order to help the body return to radiant health. And thirdly, we need to recognize that it's our inner belief system that's justifying us to react to life in a stressed way. And so the third benefit of body calm has been designed to help to clean up the unhealthy belief, to, to heal the unhealthy beliefs that are causing us to maintain and stay justified to stay stressed. And so when you when you use this form of meditation, you're you're really benefiting in a multifaceted way. 
But the good thing with body calm, it's a self-healing system. It's not just a meditation technique. Um, in the book, I've also got the embodying exercise, which is for working more targeted on spe- specific issues. It's all good just to sit and relax and you do that kind of general meditation. But some conditions require you to work more targeted. There's something specific that's happened in your life or there's some sort of experience that's going on in your life that you are essentially in conflict with, that when you reduce and release and clear that conflict, harmony is able to return. Dis-ease dissolves. The dis- disease uh, clears. And so we need to sometimes work on specific things. And so that's what the embodying exercise is for in the book. And finally, with all the understanding of the mind-body connection and all these causes, I've created five directories which basically map the entire body, listing all the mind-based causes of, of conditions. Okay. So it's quite a, it's quite a, it's more like a system of self-healing, more than just a meditation technique, and sustained health, of course. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say that. Obviously, that's a, that's a very important part of it, isn't it? I mean, it's, a, it's that balance. I'm I'm hoping that most people will use this for preventative medicine mm. because you know when you start applying uh, the, the teachings and techniques in the book, you'll discover that you won't you won't be getting so stressed. You, you know what I mean? You won't be getting so upset uh, upset about circumstances and. And you'll really recognise the underlying reasons why you do. And that could be related also to, obviously, apart from personal, mental or experiences you've had, it could also be related to diet issues or food issues, which I think is a big thing and people tend to ignore. Absolutely. You know, obviously, I've I've written a a book called Life Detox, which has got all about the detox and the diet Mm -hmm. and stuff, and the Life Change and Weight Loss book. But with this, this I really wanted to say, you know, obviously, make sure that you're taking in plenty uh, good quality fluid, um, make sure you're eating as much uh, Mother Nature as opposed to man-made food. Mm. Keep your food Mother Nature colourful rather than beige, <laughs> you know. Uh, and if you kind of keep it colourful in Mother Nature, you're doing pretty good. Mm. Um, and uh, obviously do some exercise here and there. And so obviously th- these are the things that we know about, and there's plenty of books about that. I wanted to make sure that there was some advice and guidance on the more secret source of stress, in, in essence. The intent of the magazine is obviously about helping people achieve their dreams and and what we try to do is poke them with content that hopefully inspires them to become, you know, who they want to be. Um, But my experiences are that a lot of people think it's too late, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too young. Um, Or, you know, I don't really know what I want to do in life. What's your thoughts regarding kind of really finding a meaning or true meaning in your life and and being fulfilled or and, and basically going for it? Well, first of all, you know, there's a lovely story about, you know, anyone that says it's too late. I love this story about the piano playing pensioner. Uh, have you heard that one? No. Whereby he tells his son, you know, he's age 80, and he tells his son he's going to learn to play the piano, and his son turns around to him and says, what, what's, your, what's the point? You're 80 years old. And he says, well, if I start now, I'm going to be a much better piano player come 85 than if I don't start at all. <laughs> and I just love that kind of attitude because really – yeah, you can say, well, I'm too old, but then, well, why don't you just, you know, why don't you, don't want, you, you get really ready to give up? I, I don't think you are. I hope you're not. I really want you to, you know, encourage yourself to recognize that time is but a concept. Age is a belief system largely. And if you want to rest into the present moment, you'll find your eternal child, uh, your, eternal, your eternal innocence, and your, you'll get a an excitement back for life that that the mind can get a bit tired of life and a bit uh, jaded, you know, over time. But when you return back to present moment awareness with meditation, you discover you align yourself with with innocence and excitement and childlike curiosity. I mean, I think kind of like what we're trying to say here, or you know, is is I think that as you said, it's never too late for anyone. But I also think that kind of a lot of people, you know, maybe kids coming out of university, uh, haven't got a true meaning, they don't really know right, where okay. they want to be in life, or, or maybe even people that have lost their job uh, right. and, and still haven't found their true meaning. And my thoughts are that not everybody is a publisher, not everybody is, is a is an author. Not everybody is an inspirational speaker. I don't think that's what it's about. It's, I think it's about really trying to find your true meaning and what you would like your legacy to be. Beautiful. Yeah, and, and I think a legacy should be peace, happiness, love and compassion. And beyond that, it's just the details. Mm. And if we can engage whatever we're doing with the intent to be as, as peaceful, loving and compassionate a uh, person as possible... The, the what we're doing isn't as important as how we're engaging it. Mm. And, um, it, you know, 
what I found in my own experience is that the more present I become, the less fear uh, based I am. So the less I'm governed by fear and the more I'm, I'm governed by love, the more I'm no longer limiting my intuitive hits. See, a lot of people think they don't know what they want. They do, but they're not listening to their heart. They're listening to their head. They they get these intuitive, inspirational oh, desires, and then their mind goes, "Yeah, but this, what's the point? Um, didn't happen. It's not it never happened before. So I'll probably not be able to. You know, they, they they look to the past to see what their future might be like. Mm. And if you're doing that, then you can only generally get a, a hopefully a slightly better version of what's happened so far. If you're constantly gauging your future and your past. But if you rest into the present moment, you'll see that life is bringing you your purpose all the time. It's very obvious because it's literally, it's gifted to you. It's hard to explain unless you experience it. But if you're trying to figure out and think about it, it's a really hard to try way to understand your purpose. But your purpose uh, reveals itself if you can get present enough and beyond your mind enough to live from your heart enough to actually be willing to hear it and follow it. One of the ways you can find out what, if you're on purpose or not, is a question that I like to ask people. And the question is a question that talks straight to a person's heart, which is, where in your life are you compromising? Now, by compromise, I don't mean like you're with your partner and you want to go for Chinese and they want an Indian meal, so you have a pizza because it's like a compromise. By compromise, it's whereby you are consistently being, doing and having things that you know aren't right for you, but you keep keeping that job, you keep with that relationship, you keep in that location in that house or, or that situation, even though you know it's not right for you. Uh, for, and my friend calls it, you know, having better burnt toast than no toast at all. <laughs> you know, we stick with things we don't really want for fear of not having the things we don't even really want anymore. And it, it doesn't make any sense. But compromise buys into the illusion that you can't have what you ultimately want. And that's the, that's the corrosive aspect of compromise. It buys into the illusion that you can't have what you ultimately want. So I'll stick with this mediocre because I probably can't get better anyway. We've got to stop living that way. And when you stop thinking so much, when you stop being governed by all these beliefs, and when you come back into present moment awareness, you're more willing to be uh, heroic by following your heart. And it's an incredibly powerful thing to do to, to clear up the compromises in your life. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Um, two more questions. Uh, looking at someone like yourself who struggled with public speaking, and you seem to have done okay, um, but uh, what do you think kind of like the best assets that, that, that you know we should have or are the best to have in order to, to be able to kind of like you know move forward in life? I think the biggest, most important assets to have would be Awareness and kindness. Uh, I think if if you are, you know, kindness, not just external, but within yourself. Mm. I think people are really hard on themselves, like really hard on themselves. We've picked up these ideologies and ideas about what a good life looks like and what a good human being is. And we're forever beating ourselves up for being a bit fat, a bit too thin, <laughs> a bit, you know, whatever. You know, you can just fill in the blank. Mm. And there's, there's a lot of... Uh, self-violence you know when I became a monk that's a story for another day but when I became a monk and uh, one of the vows was ahimsa which is Sanskrit and it means uh, non-violence I took that vow and I thought to myself well I'll take it because it's part of the vows but I'd, I've never been in a fight in my life you know I was the one that was bullied mm -hmm. but the reality was when I started meditating more deeply and, and playing and exploring ahimsa I hadn't I had been in a fight my whole life and it'd been with myself I'd been completely beating mm -hmm. myself up my whole life and so if you can start to see when you're being a bit harsh on yourself and just give yourself a break, mm -hmm. you know, lighten up, be more gentle on yourself. So I think this the inner gentleness that comes from kindness. And as we become more kind with ourselves, naturally we become more kind externally too. And, and I think kindness is, it really does have the power to, to, to heal the world. Uh, and, and one of the easiest ways to, to be kind is to let go of this judgmental mind. To, to let go of all the resistance and the attachments and, and all the blame games and all that sort of stuff that does tend to happen in, in the mind. And to do that is to return back to your awareness. So I really feel, you know, the two most important traits would be awareness, kindness. Powerful. My last question. Many, many years from now, what would you like your legacy to be? 
Uh, well, it's funny because um, my, my family motto says, I'll try. <laughs> and I've always thought it was a really rubbish motto. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll give it a shot, but, you know. I'll give it a go. <laughs> I'll give it a go. Um, I, I hope my, my legacy is that, you know, people turn around and say, you know, he had a good heart. He, he was kind. He, he did his best. Um, more than just trying, you know, he, he, the best you, you know, he came here and he, and he did his best. And I hope that I'm, I'm, I, I'm an encouraging force for people to experience more freedom in their life. Um, everything I do is all about helping people to be more inwardly free. Uh, because, you know, we are inherently born free and then we put boundaries around our, ourselves. And these boundaries are, are in complete conflict with human nature. And, so I hope that people will will look back and see this guy. You know, he was a, he was a nice guy, and uh, and he made a, a a positive difference to everybody that he met. Well, listen, and after meeting you, I think you should change it for I've achieved. <laughs> so because it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for watching Inspiring People Talks. Thank you. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.